feels a little bit like I'm going into a boxing ring with all the music uh, woken up, but um, unfortunately, it's not the boxing ring. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with P&I insurance and what a P&I club does, but in brief, we are the third-party liability insurer of the ship owner. This means that we would cover any liability imposed on the ship owner towards third parties. That can be crew members, it can be passengers, it can also be pollution liability, damage to cargo, and various other liabilities. However, we do not cover the damage to the vessel or its machinery. That would be the whole machinery insurance, which is not my area of expertise, so I'll stick to what I know. Uh, oh yeah. In terms of P&I cover, it's a bit different from hull machinery because there is no restrictions on the Arctic. P&I cover is a worldwide cover, and uh, as opposed to the hull machinery, has excluded zones where you would have to get additional insurance at an additional cost. P&I insurance is worldwide. However, this does not mean that we take it lightly. So uh, there could potentially be cover issues for our insured ship owners if they just simply decide to go up without letting us know. The first point of issue is that our members need to inform of us if there is an alteration of the risk. This means that, say for example, an Italian ship owner operating a dry bulk carrier in the Mediterranean suddenly decides to say, ah, it's a good idea to go to the Arctic for a voyage. We would say that's an alteration of the risk. You need to let us know before and then we will say whether or not we agree to that on the terms that we took the vessel in. Similarly, we also need to know in advance if they're choosing to kind of change their entire trade from a more traditional trade and into the Arctic. We would have to, have to know about that. Another point which could create a cover issue is that we can also deny cover if we consider that a voyage has been imprudent, unsafe or unduly hazardous. We have a very good member of us who's represented here today with Sovcom Flot. We know that they have the experience of dealing in the Arctic and we know that that's been what they've been doing for their entire operation. So we would never consider that an unduly hazardous operation. But again, say a Mediterranean ship owner going up to the Arctic with no previous expertise, that could absolutely be something that we would consider unduly hazardous. And if a claim arises as a result of that voyage, there would be some strong arguments for saying that, unfortunately, you know, this will create some cover issues. Uh, thirdly, we also have naturally under our rules, we require that all statutory requirements are followed. Now that the Polar Code has been implemented through SOLAS, if they fail, for example, to have the up-to-date uh, Polar certificates, that would be a typical breach of uh, the member's obligation towards the club. And if a claim arises as a result of that, we could potentially be, uh, potentially be dealing with a cover issue. However, when a member comes to us and says that, you know, we want to start doing a trade in the Arctic, we looked at it, as long as they've gone through it with their whole machinery underwriters and they've checked, maybe we'd have icebreak resistance if relevant, and also that the vessel is fit for the purpose in terms of being ice classed, we usually don't have any objections. However, we ask that they contact us in advance, we can provide advice and expertise and help them manage the risk. So, I don't know if you've seen the Ben Affleck movie, The Sum of All Fears. Uh, this is not exactly the same, but still, in the terms of a P&I perspective, this is really the worst we can be looking at from a casualty point of view. So, what we're looking at in a more hypothetical sense is then a uh, fully booked cruise line, say maybe 2,000 passengers, 500 crew, that has an incident in the Arctic. It can be a grounding or a fire, something that would require immediate evacuation of all the uh, people on board. As been mentioned before, I mean, the search and the rescue part of, the, of this operation will be national authorities, whether it be in Norway or Russia or wherever it is. However, we will be informed at a very early stage, and at that stage we will establish a casualty team who will be dealing with this incident. And their role will basically be to help our members liaise with all the relevant authorities, all the relevant stakeholders, public services, salvors, pollution preventers, uh, on-site personnel, uh, lawyers, uh, anyone who's involved in the accident, and try to help our members the best we can so that, uh, so that they can do all the necessary measures to kind of reduce the exposure of the incident. We will also be liaising with, uh, well, 
in terms of pollution and uh, in terms of pollution, we would be liaising obviously in Norway with the national authorities, but a lot also with pollution providers, or cleanup providers, and uh, providers in general. Uh, as for a more kind of repatriation point of view, because under P&I insurance, we also cover the repatriation of the crew and the passengers once they have safely landed ashore. That is obviously going to be a massive exercise in the Arctic due to the remoteness. First, we need to get them safely on the land. But then we also need to get everyone home, depending on where the closest land will be. And that is also something which the P&I club will be he heavily involved with. So why are we so worried about the Arctic? I think there's some key words here that's been mentioned all during today and will probably be mentioned tomorrow as well. We are afraid because of the remoteness and the limited infrastructure. This will make any search and rescue operation difficult. It will make any repatriation difficult. It will make any pollution prevention or pollution cleanup very difficult. And it's kind of the overreaching problem of the, of the region. And it's also, unfortunately, a problem that we can't really do much about. I mean, it is a remote area. It will always be a remote area. And even if we do increase the infrastructure on land, the cruise ships will go further. They will gonna want to go closer to the icebergs and see the polar bears and see the extreme nature. And that's just how, what we need to face. But the remoteness is really a problem. And also, combine that with the limited infrastructure, that results in a reduced response or a very long res response time for search and rescue providers. And I mean, we all know that the longer time for the on personnel to, res to arrive on site, well, unfortunately, the, it increases the chances of the loss of life. Uh, it has been discussed earlier today, hypothermia, it's a big issue. If they get wet, if they're cold, if we're talking about days before help arrives, then we are looking at serious uh, fatalities, most likely. We're hoping that we're going to be like the Sorry in our movie, and that that's going to be the scenario that we'll be looking at, but I'm not confident that we are there today, unfortunately. Also mentioned previously, it's the communication issues and the reduced satellite, broadband, and radio services in, well, the closer you get to the North Pole. This will reduce the possibility of having a very effective uh, search and rescue system between the land, the rescue services, and the ship itself, and may create some issues during the actual both search, but also the evacuation later on. Naturally, an environmentally sensitive area where pollution prevention and cleanup is just, well, first of all, it's more complicated due to the ice. Second, we don't know that well how oil reacts in ice over time, so we, we're not 100% sure what is the best type of, uh, type of cleanup procedures to be used in this area. And, uh, and thirdly, it just makes it complicated to reach the areas where, uh, where the oil has gone, and if it's gone under the ice, then it's difficult to clean up. So, so that's also a big issue for us, and we know it. I mean, we're the ones who's going to sit with the bill in the end, so we are very worried about that aspect of it. And, uh, and also, finally, it's a lack of suitable response equipment, uh, both on the vessels and on shore at the different infrastructure points. There's some requirements under the Polar Code on what kind of equipment should be on board the vessels, but as far as we can see from the relevant studies that has been done, that might not be adequate in a proper evacuation uh, scenario in the Arctic. And lastly, it's been mentioned as wreck removal uh, shortly. It's also, we will be struggling to do a wreck removal in the Arctic. That's also a bill that comes to the uh, p &I Club in the end. Uh, and it will be a very, very challenging exercise for us if the government or the public authorities impose on the ship owner to remove the wreck. So on that happy note, thank you very much. <laughs>